Welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to be talking with Pete Hill uh, from the D Word, a radio uh, station over in the UK. And he, he is just wonderful, wonderful to speak with. Um, but before I introduce you to Pete, I want to mention a couple of support groups that I do. Uh, one is virtual, so that is Arthur's Memory Cafe. We get together the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock central time. And uh, we've got people from Belgium to um, New Jersey to Florida. Um, I'm here in Minnesota, and that's you know where most of us are from, but you are more than welcome to attend. Just reach out to me at Lori, L-O-R-I, at alzheimerspeaks.com, and I can get you the link. And if you happen to be in Minnesota in the Shoreview area, on the last Wednesday of the month, we get together in person at the Shoreview Community Center, and that is from 10 to 1130, and that also has respite. Uh, so again, you can reach out to me or you can call 763-913-6140 and register. What else? I want to direct you to Alzheimer's Speaks uh, main website. There you're going to be able to find information on all of our free resources. We've got a ton of them that we've been curating since 2009. And um, you can also check out our book, Betty the Bald Chicken Lessons in How to Care, which makes a great gift all year long, but especially around the holidays uh, when sometimes people are feeling a little left out. And then, of course, don't forget to check out Dementia Map, our global resource directory. You'll find all kinds of information there. So let's go ahead and introduce you to Pete. So Pete, I'm so excited to uh, finally have you back on the show. It's been a while. We've been in conversation talking about uh, having you on, and I'm and I'm thrilled that you're here for the holiday season. So welcome. Thank you, Laurie. It's uh, it's a delight to be back uh, with you again at uh, this uh, time of year as well. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to chatting. Well, I always um, again thank you. I for people who don't know, um, Pete's over in the UK, so we've got a little bit of a time difference and stuff. So that can always make our schedules a little more complicated uh, to work with. But he's just a doll to uh, to coordinate things. Um, I want to um, ask you, you know, because our our listeners may not know this, but have you been personally touched in your own family or circle of friends by dementia? Yeah, I, I've been touched uh, in my family, strangely, after I started doing uh, the D word and the radio and, you know, I guess stuff will go on to. Uh, when my mother-in-law was uh, diagnosed with uh, mixed dementia, um, which was five years ago, I think, or, or there or, or thereabouts. And before that, um, I had a grandma who was a very uh, strict Victorian lady, uh, lived through three centuries um, because she was uh, born in 18, uh, 1898 and died in 2001. Um, so she was uh, an, a very interesting lady. And towards the end of her life, um, really at, uh, at the time, everybody thought, oh, well, you know, grandma's 101. So uh, perhaps she's got license to be a bit strange. Uh, and that was as far as it got. Uh, as far as as far as it went with grandma, so I didn't really notice too much then. But uh, yeah, with my with my own mother in law, I did notice, and uh, you know, sadly, I think she went downhill fairly quickly at the end. 
because I don't think it had been picked up at the beginning um, because she'd lived uh, a life with my father-in-law. He was quite domineering. He then went seriously ill for a couple of years. Uh, and I think that masked everything uh, with her, which was uh, unfortunate. And uh, yeah, sadly, she passed away during COVID, which, uh, you know, had its own uh, complications. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's interesting that you started the D word before um, really being touched. I mean, you, you had your, your grandma there, but wow, to live through three centuries, what she must have seen in that time frame. It's kind of mind blowing when you think about how much life has changed. Why don't you tell people a little bit about the D word and why you started it? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I worked for the um, for the Alzheimer's Society here in the UK for a couple of years, uh, twenty sixteen to twenty eighteen, uh, and I managed activity groups well for people living with dementia in the community. Uh, and when that came to an end, uh, I was kind of sitting around scratching my head on a rainy Thursday, and thought, well, oh, I still want to be involved in this world somehow. Um, but I had actually no idea how. So I thought, well, what are your other great things you can do? And the only other thing I've been involved in, uh, apart from my career, which was in uh, public health, was uh, I was involved in radio since I was a volunteer at the age of 18. So I thought, hmm, let's just put radio and dementia into uh, to Google. Uh, and I put radio plus dementia into Google and it, it, it equaled Alzheimer's Speaks and You. Um, and, I, and I had a look and I thought, hmm, wait a minute, let's have a listen to this. Had a listen and thought, I like this. Surely somebody else must be doing that. Um, did a little bit of searching around and found there was nothing at all at the time in the UK, not even a podcast or anything. And this was uh, 2018, 2019. And so I thought, well, let's give it a go. Um, so I got a demo tape to uh, together, sent it off to UK Health Radio. I'd done a little bit of work with before, um, thinking, great, let's just see how we go. Um, and I got a phone call back from uh, Johan, who's the, the MD, who I now know well. Um, and the, he said to me, Pete, oh, I've got your demo. I really like it. But, you know, I've been involved in radio since I was a teenager. So I'm waiting for the word but because that, that always follows. I really like it. But uh, but it didn't. Uh, and what followed was, can you do me one a week? Uh, and I've got to be honest, Laurie, what, what followed then was me going into a mild panic, thinking I, this is a great idea, but how am I going to keep it going uh, and doing one a week? Oh, too funny. Yeah, it's uh, well, it, it, it shocks me that in that era around, you said, what, 2018, there really wasn't anything over there. Because I think I, I started back in, I think, 2011 and uh, around that time. And to me, there wasn't, I didn't find anything here. I didn't really do a whole lot of searching, but I just thought, why aren't we using this medium? This is just something that is so normal for people to listen to. You know, it, to me, it seemed kind of asinine that we weren't tapping into it. So, you know, I, I was just so excited to, to hear about, hear about your show. Now your show is a little bit different than mine. So uh, talk, talk how you structure your show and what your focus is. Yeah, sure. Um, um, to be honest, when I first started, I heard your show and I thought, hey, this is great. Uh, and then I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Uh, and so I, I kind of hit upon a formula which has gone all the way through. I didn't think it last, but it has um, because I play a little bit of music um, and I play the music just to break up the conversation a little bit. Um my taste in, in music is, is very kind of acoustic, funky Americana music, which somehow seems to have fit. I, I didn't know it would, uh, but I've actually had people say, hey, I really like that music you're playing on your show. So, so obviously it does fit. Uh, and between some little musical interludes, I chat, as you do, with, uh, with guests. Um, I've got to say the worry at the beginning was, uh, as I was saying, how am I going to find these people to talk to? 
uh, you know, I've got absolutely no idea. And I found probably for the first two, three months, I was rushing out trying to grab people saying, would you like to talk to me? Would you like to talk to me? Um, and it's really strange that where are we now? Well, I started in 2019, so we're we're four years on. Um, and it's gone completely full circle the other way. Uh, and the fact I'm now booked for guests till the middle of February. Uh, and I have people coming towards me saying, hey, can I be on your show? So, um, and it's a formula that, you know, works for me. It, it seems to, to work for the audience, seems to work for the guests. And um, we've been going for four years, so we must have got something right. <laughs> well, that's just incredible. It, and it's, um, I love how you incorporate the music into that. I, I, I couldn't do that for the life of me. I, I just don't have enough um, background in terms of even what to choose or what to drop in. But your your show really is very fun to listen to. And I, I love to hear that, you know, you're not searching people out, that they're coming to you. To me, that says two things. One, you're doing a great job, but B, that people see this as really meaningful and that people are listening. You know, they wouldn't hear about you if they haven't heard, you know, about the show itself. And so to me, that says, you know, this is an important niche um, that, that needs to be expanded upon. You know, I don't think, I don't think we can have enough shows out there. You know, everybody has a different personality, a different style, just, just like TV or, you know, writers, journalists and stuff. We have our favorites out there and in radio isn't any different. And, uh, so a very, very cool. Who all do you interview? Do you have a, a, a target market in mind? Um, no, not really. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the beginning, I've got to say, when uh, I went for interviewing people, I went for what I call here in the UK anyway, the larger players in the game who were the, the big charities, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK, et cetera. And, you know, they do a good job. I don't decry at all what they do. But I also found they've all got media and publicity departments who take care of a lot of stuff for them. Um, and I then started talking to a lot of the smaller charities who don't have any money to have a media or a publicity department to uh, take care of all that. And we're really thankful to be talking to someone who was raising their profile. So I think probably that's the market that I've tended to concentrate on. And the other area was right from the beginning, I said, I want to get people living with dementia on the show. Um, and I, I had friends who were living with dementia I'd made through the Alzheimer's Society in my my job there. And so from the beginning, you know, I have people living with dementia on the show and they've been some of the, the most brilliant shows that, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed. Now, do you do you interview like family caregivers and researchers and things like that as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's another area. Um, a lot of the researchers are, are the people I've found probably over the last 18 months, two years, the people that have come to me um, because, you know, they have a real difficulty in getting their research out there. Uh, and one of the things also is, uh, and I think they realise it as well, when you get to talking to a researcher, um, they are very academically brilliant people, but sometimes the PR side is a little bit difficult. I'm finding people to talk to. Uh, and I think, like yourself, I don't know, we seem to have hit this niche in the market here, whereby a lot of the researchers that talk to me, I just have a chat with. Uh, I don't give them a list of questions of, I want to know this, 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 and why is this, 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 and the other. Uh, and they tend to relax. Uh, and they tend to really like the approach. Uh, and I've got a few now that will go on back in six months time because i say well you know we like to follow the story here so uh, we've heard about this bit come back in six months see how we get on um which i think is really important as well to uh, to follow things through so i think uh, you know it's a wide wide area i mean i've gone all the way from the chief executive of the alzheimer's society and this is not to uh, put any criticism or whether on the other end of the scale was the lovely lady who uh, runs uh, a, a service whereby she takes her horse tower and a horse box to uh, care facilities here in the UK for people who used to enjoy a horse riding and under controlled environment they can go and meet the horse 
in the horse box. It's called a happiness horse box. So I've gone all the way from the chief executive of the Alzheimer's Society to the one lady band as it is. It does a brilliant job with the happiness horse box. Well, and I, I love to hear that because I think I don't think we can make um, a sustainable change if we're not inclusive of all voices. And if people don't know what all is out there, I mean, I think for such a long time, people only thought it was the Alzheimer's Association and the Alzheimer's Society. And there are so many other support services out there as well. And people deserve to know all of them. And even between us and the others that are out there, we'll never get them all out there, but we sure as heck are giving it a good try. And, um, and, and people, you know, that gives them hope and it gives them options. Um, so you feel a little bit more in control with things. Now you just reached your 200th, um, show. Um, how did that make you feel? Oh, amazing. Um, when I started, to be honest with you, I thought I might reach 20, let alone 200. So, uh, Getting the two hundred was was incredible, and and just having the ability to look back and realise all the people I'd spoken to and all the friends I'd made as well, uh, in in taking two hundred shows on it was yeah you know, just phenomenal. I, it was something I never envisaged would happen. Um, but you look, you know, I look around now. I'd, I've just mixed another show which will be going live, you know, uh, shortly, uh, and that's D word number two hundred and seven. Uh, and I was counting up to 200, and I'm suddenly thinking, wait a minute, I've done 207, and, you know, I'm counting up to 300 now. It's uh, it's amazing. Now, how long are your shows, typically? Yeah, the, the, the show in itself, from a listener perspective, is an hour. Well, for those of you that are just tuning in right now, we are talking with Pete Hill, who is the host of The D Word, which is with UK Health Radio and we've just learned, you know, why he started. He's on 207 shows now. And we're going to be talking about how he's seen things change over, over the years that he's been doing this since like twice. He said 2019 is when you officially, officially started. You can find him on Mixcloud. He's on um, X or Twitter at Radio TDW or Instagram, TDW underscore radio, uh, Facebook, the DW radio, and then LinkedIn as Peter Hill. And you're also on threads, uh, which is TDW underscore radio. And you can go directly to the website, which is ukhealthradio.com forward slash program forward slash the D word. He is just a joy. And it's just been so fun to see his program expand over the years and, and to stay in contact too um, has been really, really neat um, to do. So uh, Pete, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how you've seen kind of dementia change since you've been in this space. Have you seen any movement? It's a, yeah, I've, I've thought about that, uh, and it's a kind of yes and no answer because before I got actually involved in this space, I had a different view. I was almost on the outside looking in, uh, and I feel now I'm involved in the space. I'm almost on the inside looking out. So my kind of viewpoint has, has changed a little bit because I tend to be talking to a people who are on the inside, uh, and so I tend to get that view. So every now and again, I have to draw breath and kind of go outside and talk to friends and family who don't have any involvement and try and gauge from them how things are going out there. Um, I don't think that, you know, there has been a change, but there is still a lot of frustrations uh, for me in terms of dementia is now mentioned more, I would say, than than when I started. Um, but it's still seen as, uh, you know, this is something you get when you're old. Um, I don't think that's changed one jot since I, I started. Um, and the other thing that hasn't really changed, and I hopefully it will, is this whole thing that there is a lot of things we can do now to prevent us 
developing dementia in the future or certainly to lower our chances of developing dementia in the future. And I think this message really hasn't got across because, you know, the latest World Alzheimer's Report 2023 is on risk reduction. Um, and I think that's an area that is still in its infancy, as far as I see it, with people I speak to, because, you know, it's, it's kind of still seen, I think, out there as well. Do you mean dementia is pretty inevitable? Either you're going to get it or you're not, and there isn't really a lot you can do about it, um, which, you know, is certainly not the story. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, since I've been doing this, I've like like you, I've seen movement and then I haven't. Like, you know, one of the things that I haven't seen move is doctors really being educated and referring people out to places that can help. And, you know, I just think that that's sinful, um, especially nowadays, every doctor's office anyways, here in the U.S. I mean, it has a computer and it has a printer and there's no excuse for that. I, I'm tired of hearing, well, you know, we we don't want to we don't want to be biased or we don't want to um, get infected by a virus if we go to their website or, you know, we don't want to get sued if they make a, if they make an error and we get pulled in. It's like it, people have to get beyond themselves and go, you can print a flyer, you can pull one together. This isn't a difficult thing. You, you don't have to compromise yourself and you can put a disclosure on it. And I think it would change how doctors give a diagnosis. Um, here in the States, I mean, there was a study not too long ago saying 50% of the people diagnosed weren't even told because the doctors feel uncomfortable because there's nothing that they know, you know what to do. I think it would give the doctors hope and it wouldn't be such a doom and gloom thing too. I have seen you know, more radio shows. I've seen more um, people starting businesses and getting creative because they've gone through the experience and they've, they've seen kind of a crack they can fill. Um, but where we're still not doing well is getting the word out that there's all these little crack fillers out there. <laughs> there's all these, all these support groups and services that are available and, and um, YouTube channels and blogs and Facebook groups and I mean, the list just goes on and on and on things that are being created, which I love that people are stepping in and stepping up who are in the trenches or who are observing and saying we can do better. And I still think we have a long ways to go in doing better, but I, but I do feel hopeful. Um, and when I started, I, I started because I didn't feel hopeful. <laughs> you know, uh, on my mission there. Now, you had your own, you know, health scare here, uh, not too long ago. And I'm wondering if that changed the way you look at care in general, and if that's affected how you look at dementia care. Yeah, I think, you know, the answer is, is, is yes. Um, for people that don't know, I was diagnosed 18 months ago with bowel cancer. And thankfully, prognosis is very good i've come out you know the other end and now i'm just on regular scans that's uh that's it so i'm you know I'm very thankful for that and yeah it does change your mind because you know i was aware of um what the people around me um uh, were doing to look after me when i you know when i was in in that situation uh and that gives you a lot more focus on the life of, of a carer and you know how difficult it can be and for you it also makes you stop and take note of the things around you um and you know the, the thought that came to my mind was yeah it, it's a life-threatening condition yeah it was scary at the time um but i was looking at light at the end of the tunnel all the time um and i i went and, and spoke to a counselor uh, and one of the things she said to me was, you realise that at the end of this, when you come out of this, you're not going to be the same person you were when you went in. Uh, and that sounds a bit depressing. And she gave it a perfect pause before she said, but you could come out of this, the new improved model. Um, and I've lived that mantra now for the last year. Uh, and it got me thinking about my friends living with dementia, that I'm very fortunate um, I had a major health scare, but there was light at the end of my tunnel. 
sadly, with dementia, it's a terminal illness and there isn't a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the only thing you can do is hopefully extend your way into that tunnel with the light um, and for, for as long as you can. Um, and that was a kind of blinding perspective for, for me, looking at, at people living with dementia and their carers and probably understanding even more um, what they must be going through. Did you feel a period of, of isolation and, and depression? I mean, that's one of the things that we hear from people with dementia all the time upon diagnosis. I would imagine you probably went through that too with a chronic illness like that. Yeah, you do. Um, you see, our whole world falls apart because, um, you know, you, you've got an uncertain future. You don't know what's going on. You've got certain, you know, physical things that are happening to your body as well. Um, and you, your head's in the spin. It makes you feel very uncertain about what's going on. Uh, it's uncertain in your relationships with people around you. Um, my friends have been brilliant um, with, you know, 100 percent. But, you, uh, you know, it's strange. You don't know how they're going to react. You don't know how anybody's going to react to this thing. And I know I've talked to friends, you know, living with dementia. And, you know, one of the things they've said is is my friends just couldn't cope. Um, as soon as I got my diagnosis, the phone stopped ringing. People stopped coming around. They stopped inviting me around for a barbecue or whatever. Um, and, I, you know, I could really feel that in the fact that you do... Thankfully for me, I didn't go through that, but it could have happened um, quite easily. And I think the one thing that I learned about it is right from the beginning, when I had my um, when I had my illness, I was a hundred percent open with a hundred percent of people. Everybody knew um, because that was my decision, and that's the decision you have to make as to, as to whether you're going to do that. And for me, it worked because I got tremendous support, but. I can then think back when you get a dementia diagnosis, you're sitting there thinking, who do I tell? How do I tell them? And do I tell everybody? Um, and that's got to be, you know, it's a really difficult decision. It's huge. How did you deal with all the emotions? Did you find that there was support in the medical model or was that something you had to really maneuver yourself? Uh, a little bit of each, really. One was having great confidence in the people that were treating me, which I had, mm -hmm. uh, and that really helps. You know, I had a hundred percent confidence in my oncologist, my surgeon, etc. Just you know, unbelievable people, um, and I think that helps. And again, when you you kind of look back in the parallels with dementia, well, what we were you know talking about, someone get a diagnosis from a GP. Um, I've had people that have said to me, well, when I went in with my wife, my husband, my loved one, um, the doctor's reaction was, well, here's a diagnosis of dementia. When they go and dress themselves, bring them back. Uh, I'm thinking, wow, you know, all the support I had, at least I knew where I was going. I still know where I'm going. I know when I've got my scans, you know, plumbed in for the next year or whatever. I know who to call everything's certain whereas you know, how can you have a diagnosis and, and that level of uncertainty um i don't think i would have been able to go with that when i was in you know in, in my situation i think that's a really good point because i think of how many people we talk to and we hear this story over and over and over again of my doctor doesn't even know what this disease is about. They don't know how to help me or they switch doctors. And now it's like, oh, no, you don't have this. You have this and their symptoms haven't changed. And so it's like, well, what do I have? And then after a while, they just get used to nobody really knows what I have because it's changed from Alzheimer's to Lewy body to MCI to Oh, now I've got Parkinson's in, in, you know, many of them have multiples, but it's, it's like a moving, it's like a moving target with no real answers. And, you know, what I hear from, from um, people living with dementia is they feel like many doctors have a, have a bias or a leaning towards a certain thing. And that's what you have, you know, cause it, it's difficult to diagnose and instead of openly talking about that, I think so many families are feeling like they're educating the doctors 
um, on this conversation or trying to, and, and some listen, but some don't in terms of symptoms and things like that. So they seem to have to do a lot more defensive work <laughs> and offensive work um, when trying to maneuver a, a chronic illness like this. Uh, I, I also, you know, I was so glad to hear that your friends were supportive because again, that's one of those things you, you say you've heard and I've heard it a zillion times too, how friends and family just fall away because they don't know how to deal with it. And gosh, we shouldn't be walking away when people need our support like that. I mean, we've got to, we've got to do better and we have to remove our fears. Um, but some of it is having those open conversations too. And like you said, you know, I just told everybody, and people with dementia kind of think that over in terms of the reactions. And when we don't lay it all out there, then people don't really know what's going on. And, and uh, I know I even hit it like with my, my mom had brain cancer, or my mom had dementia for 30 years. My dad had brain cancer and their friends knew the titles, but they didn't really know the specifics. And I'll just give an example of they went out to eat one time and they came back and they were all excited and their friends had invited them to go south for the winter with them. And I'm like, oh, there's no way they can go. They can't maneuver this. There's there's just absolutely no way that would ever, ever work out. And I was so angry at the friends. And yet I I had to blame myself going, I really wasn't honest with them. You know, I was going over and shaving dad and making sure that he had enough money to pay for lunch and that everything looked okay. And then when they got together, they reminisced. So nothing seemed to change. Everything seemed to appear all right. Um, but yet on so many levels, it wasn't. And, and it's, a, it's a difficult conversation um, to have because it's uncomfortable to know how are they going to receive this? But then there's that whole dignity aspect of, of not wanting people to look at you differently. And you don't know that until the cat's out of the bag, how, how people are going to react. Um, there's no questionnaire you can send you know, ahead of time to kind of figure that out. And that, that adds a lot when you think of taking on this, this chronic diagnosis and then you're thinking your whole, you know, social sphere could change on top of that in terms of supports you've always relied on and been part of. And I just, I just can't imagine. Um, and I, I say, I can't imagine I've seen it, but I haven't physically had to make those choices and go through it my, myself personally with the diagnosis, but wow, talk about overwhelming on a massive level. So I, I'm really glad that you shared, you know, your health situation. And because to me, it really brings to light the differences in how far we, how far we've come with cancer versus how far we've come with dementia. And it's, it, there's a pretty blatant difference in multiple levels. Um, I know with breast cancer, you know, you can, you know, go get a free wig and, you know, they do all these holistic things, even in your appointment to keep you calm. But I haven't heard of any of those types of things really being implemented for people with dementia. Have you in, in any of your interviews? Not really. No. And I think that's, uh, you know, another matter of uh, perhaps of frustration. Why I have heard is exactly, you know, to echo what you've just said, I've had a number of researchers say to me, well, we're actually where cancer was 30 years ago. Uh, and that, that really we've, we've you know, got a, a long way to go forward. And I think, yeah, it's so difficult, you know, because one of the things you have to be is honest with yourself as well. Uh, as being honest with with everybody else, because one of the other results of of my surgery was for eleven months I had a stoma bag, okay, and you you often wonder you know how people are going to react to this, Ooh, you know that that kind of thing, and and that also focused my mind on what it must be like when you tell people oh, I've been diagnosed with dementia, because you know this little thing caused massive misunderstanding. Nobody knows, you know, I didn't know what it did. I have absolutely no idea. I thought I'm suddenly lumbered with this thing. I've got absolutely no idea. 
um, you know, asked me about it six months earlier. I couldn't have told you what it was or what it did or whatever. Um, and there's so much of this I don't know, so I'm going to be frightened of it. Um, thing I did with my stoma bag, not to concentrate on it, so I gave it a name. I called it Cliff, and it became a little person to my friends. Um, and actually, when I had it removed and I had my reversal operation in May this year, I actually got cards saying goodbye, Cliff. So it, it, it was a way that it, it, it just lightened, it took all the mystery out of it, and I could be normal again. And I, I just wish that people would do that more with people living with dementia. Because I think one of the things I said, my experience with the Alzheimer's Society was it was a tough time. I found a lot of the bureaucracy with the organisation tough, but the people were amazing. And, uh, you know, I like a laugh, I like comedy, and some of the comedy I got with those people living with dementia, just unbelievable. We had so much fun um what we were doing and i you know i had some of the best jokes i've ever heard uh and yet to the the out when you when you're on the outside looking in people well you can't have enjoyed yourself you were working with people with dementia you you couldn't have laughed well yeah of course you can um and i you know i've got some great one of the greatest like i mean a couple of weeks ago um i spoke to uh, agnes houston who's got an mbe uh, Agnes has been a brilliant dementia campaigner. Uh, and Agnes has got this theory. She said, well, look, when I got diagnosed, that I looked at my daughter. My daughter was a bit crestfallen. And, and, and I said to her, well, look, we've got two choices here. She says, either I get on the miserable bus or I get on the happy bus. Which one do you want to take? Shall we get on the happy bus? And she said, I've lived my life like that. But since she got diagnosed in 2006, I think it was. And she's been on the happy bus ever since. Because at that point, she made the decision, I'm not going to sit here and mope and feel sorry for myself. I'm going to get on the happy bus and away I go. Um, and, you know, really brave decision to make. But it's, it's something that, you know, we just need to get rid of this myth about the fact that people with dementia have got this massive great label um, and they're not part of society anymore. Well, and I think the other thing with Agnes is she brings up, we have choice. We have choice how we're going to live our life. How are we going to look at things? And some of the, I mean, the worst, most embarrassing things that happen to us in life. I mean, they're not funny at the time, but we can look back at them later on and go, oh my gosh, can you believe, you know, we did this during that time or whatever. And, and I, am I just think laughter is the best medicine. I think staying socially connected is what is called for. I, I think, I think my mom lived 30 years because she was socially connected. And yet I don't think, and it's gotten better, but I don't think that social aspect, you know, of interconnectedness has really hit its height by any stretch of the imagination, people are still shocked when they ask me, you know, what do you think is the most important thing? And, and I said, I can go through all the prevention things. I said, but to me, I'm not a medical person. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a social worker, but for me and all of the people that I have talked to and heard from, the number one thing is staying socially connected and feeling purposeful and valued. And, and, and I think that that goes way past dementia. I think that's what everybody wants in their life. I would imagine you've heard this. I've heard it a zillion times from people diagnosed. I have never felt so purposeful in my whole life since my diagnosis, because they know change needs to be made and they've stepped in and they've stepped up and they have made amazing friendships and they have developed wonderful resources and they have become, you know, these just exuberant um, advocates to educate people and let them know that there's life. And, you know, that makes them feel good, makes them feel proud. And not that it doesn't take a lot out of them at times, and they might crash for two days after they've gone to a conference to speak. But most say they would do it all over again because of the way it makes them feel. And when they're at that high, when they're feeling in the zone, their symptoms lessen. 
Um, but then, but then they get bullied because then people go, well, you can't have it. Look at, you just did a speech. You just did this. There's no way you have dementia. And they're like, oh, but they're not seeing all the other things throughout my day that I can't do, or I can't do the way I used to do them. And there's this judgment. There's this, um, I, I don't know, people just not trusting. I, I've heard people go, oh, it's just a scam. You know, oh, What? They have to fight to, you know, over here, it, it, our medical system doesn't just jump right in. I mean, they have to fight to get financial aid and to get diagnosis, get, get diagnosed. And I mean, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of sacrifice that comes with this disease. Um, the bullying, I think, is one of the toughest things for me to witness out there in terms of how far we need to move forward. I, it's just the evilness of, of some of the bullying is just something I never, it never even occurred to me what happened. Have you heard some of those, those stories from people too, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah, again, it goes back to this thing of, uh, you know, the, I, when I first started um, at the Alzheimer's Society, I was outside a room which had 15, 16 people living in the dementia inside it. Um, and I, 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 I would sort of part of the myth of, well, I don't know what to do here because I don't know who these people are. Uh, and not who these people are, but what these people are. Um, I went in and I was myself and I suddenly realised that it's kind of strange, really. If you'd filmed it, then suddenly the, the, everybody, when I walked in, had a big D over their head. And as I got talking to them, they got talking to me, these Ds just bang, 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 disappeared. Um, and they were people. Um, and it was, you know, it wasn't Dennis with dementia. It was Dennis. It wasn't uh, Iris with dementia. It was Iris. They became my friends. But in becoming my friends, I realised quite how vulnerable they were as well um, in terms of some the way that they can be treated by other parts of society sadly can be treated by their own family members as well which was you know something that um i came into contact with uh and i thought was was really shocking uh and very difficult to deal with and it was you know it's just one it's just simple things really that that concentrate on your mind one of the ladies she sadly passed on now but uh, we had a bit of a bond because we like music and and various other things she was a a london lady like i'm a i'm a london lad so we yeah we had good chats and one day she gave me her, her mobile phone and she had one of these mobile phones with really big numbers on it which was great and she said i keep getting calls from these these people you know, I said, well, what do you mean, these people? Um, and she was being called by people that were offering her insurance and saying the insurance on her washing machine had run out and all this stuff. Um, and I said to her, well, look, you know, we can block those. And she said, well, can you? And so I went through her phone, she said, block this caller, block this caller, block this caller. And I came away from that thinking it's horrendous. You know, people should not be subject to this. Um, and we, we should have a much better way of looking after our vulnerable people because, you know, there are stories of, of things that happen in care, which are, you know, are very you know horrendous. But when people are out in the community, um, they've got very little. And, you know, I, I don't know whether you get it in the States, but I get hassled every time in terms of people phoning and wanting this and that over the phone. And, you know, I say I'm big enough and ugly enough to take care of myself. But I get I get really annoyed with these people and maybe I shouldn't. But the reason I get really annoyed with these people is I think back to my friends living with dementia and thinking, well, wait a minute, if this was them, they not may not be able to react the way that I do. Um, and I think it's something we need to take a lot more seriously um, in terms of society. And I think business needs to uh, step up to the mark and take it a lot more seriously as well. I, I agree. Well, I can't believe we're almost running out of time here. I want to talk about your future and what are your three wishes that you have for the future? Um, number one is, is earlier diagnosis. 
um, because we've had big breakthroughs with drug treatments, but the real rider on all those drug treatments at the moment is they're only really um, for people in the very early stages. So if we don't get early diagnosis, the drug treatment's effectiveness is not going to be as effective, quite simply. Um, I suppose number two is carrying on from what we've been saying, and let's do away with the myths and treat people like people. Um, I think too often we're treating a condition instead of treating people. Um, I think it's sometimes also, I mean, go back to my family experience. My my um, mother-in-law was in a care facility that had a dementia floor. Uh, and so you had 20, 30 people, I think, living with dementia all on one floor. Um, there must be a way that you know, you put 30 people together in a hotel, they're all going to like different things. They're going to like different music and they watch different stuff on the TV. They're going to have different views. Um, so there must be a, a better way of us being able to individualize our care. Mm-hmm. Um, cause for, for her, what it meant is there was some loud people who kind of ruled the roost with the TV remote. So she didn't go in the lounge. Well, you know, surely we can do better than that. Um, and I think sometimes that's very frustrating in terms of, of the way we're, uh, you know, while we offer that kind of care. And number three is better support for carers. Um, people don't realise what they're going through. Uh, and I, I'll just say that because they don't. Um, you take carers out of our country, we take carers out of your country, we take carers out of any country and the economy collapses. It's quite simple. Um, so I don't know why those people that, you know, have the bird strings at the top of the tree can't actually see that um, because they're being, you know, we had financial crisis and various things, various people bailing people out was the, the end phrase, wasn't it? Well, governments throughout the world are being bailed out by carers um, and they need to do something about it. They need to treat them a lot more seriously. Oh, I so agree. And I think, you know, I think they're too busy trying to figure out how they can make money off them instead of how they can save money by caring for them, you know, in the, in the whole system. And it's, yeah, it's very backwards. (laughs) It's very backwards. I've noticed too, that over the years, there's a lot more people stepping into this space, which is good, but not everyone is not everyone has integrity, I guess, in terms of serving. Um, There's a lot more people looking at how do we make money off this demographic? And that just drives me bonkers. I mean, I understand that that's kind of the base of, you know, of every country and, and financial system, but there's got to be a balance. And Families can't afford 20 bucks here and 20 bucks there. And, uh, you know, plus trying to figure out how to pay their medications and their co-pays and stuff that we have here. Um, It's just, it's a lot. It's a lot, especially when many times they've lost an income to boot, you know, with things. So um, gosh, Pete, I could, I could talk with you all day. I do want to ask you one question because this, this frustrates me when it comes to research and I, and I think the, the, the scope has, <clears throat> has expanded, but we still seem to be tied in a knot with tangles and plaques, even though it's been proven tangles and plaques aren't a black and white thing out there. And I, I, to me, it's like, I just don't know how we break that theory to show it's much bigger than that. And it seems like every researcher I talk to when I bring that up, they, they make the correlation that dementia is going to be kind of like cancer. Cancer was kind of one thing in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's this and it's that. And there's all these different types and all of these different types need different types of treatment, you know, from a medical standpoint, but they also need treatment from that human standpoint that you were talking about as well. Any ideas on tackling that? Or maybe you maybe you disagree with that too. No, I don't disagree at all. It's a tough one, and I think the the social elements and the the power of the social elements are underestimated in terms of research. Um, you said, "Why well, I'm with you, Mum," 
uh, you know, and, uh, and how much longer she went on. I look at people that, that I know, and there's no doubt about that. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, researchers get put down a bit of a golden sack and a line because that's where the money is. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, if you can say, well, this is dementia, it's called by tangles and plaques. So if you give us this much money, we might be able to find a cure. Like, you know, my theory is there's probably a long line of, of of researchers all outside the door of the the person with the money. They've probably got about five minutes to get their point across. Um, and the problem is if you start to try and explain all the benefits of social interactions and et cetera, um, you're probably not going to get enough time. You're going to get thrown out and you're not going to get your money. Whereas if you actually concentrate on something that they might have read in the newspaper, I think the only thing we can do, and the other thing, to be honest, looking at the research thing um, frustrates me a little, is the fact that also a lot of the organisations seem to be, we should be doing it all for the common good. One of the brilliant things about the space that you and I operate in, we're all friends. Yeah, I, I agree. I think they look at each other as competitors and they're everyone's trying to protect their own kind of pot of gold and uh, and how they can how they can go about that. I did approach one a couple of researchers that I've had on lately and I said, can, why can't you include a social engagement piece into your studies? And they said, well, that could throw it for a loop. And I'm like, instead of having two, you know, the placebo and and the one that's getting the real one, why can't you do, you know, a third or a fourth, both having that social engagement piece in it. And granted, it would cost a little bit more, but I think they're, I really think they're afraid um, to see the results of that come out in the study. But I think, boy, if we could get a medication and social engagement together, you know, we could really maybe make some headway. But I think that there's great fear that this social engagement piece um, might grab hold and take some of the the money from the pharmaceuticals away. And and I think there's great, great fear in that. You know, in terms of of pharmaceuticals and whatever, uh, you know, just to conclude, I think we're far too quick as a society to think I've got a problem here's someone that can solve it by taking a bill uh and I think dementia you know please don't let it go for a full tilt down that route it's not the route to go because we've we've proved with other illnesses there are loads and loads of illnesses there are massive social impacts that you're going to have with you know something here in the UK which is called social prescribing where people are actually cottoning on to the fact, finally, prescribe things and prescribe certain social activities, we can cut down very much on the burden of disease. Well, there are loads and loads of things that we can do in terms of of dementia and with a lot of things we can do before people develop dementia as well. Uh, And that's an area we really want to concentrate on, yes, a drug treatment would be brilliant, but as you say, it's only part of the game. Uh, Unfortunately, it gets 99% of the newspaper headlines, but that's because of the way you look at things as society at the moment. I agree. Well, Pete, this has just been a wonderful conversation with you. You are welcome on the show anytime. I just adore you to death. I love the work you're doing and um, I'm thrilled to be able to call you a friend. So in wrapping up again, we've been talking with Pete Hill with the D word on UK health radio. And as always, I want to ask my listeners to be a giver of hope like, click and share this show and go follow him. Go listen to his show. You know, one isn't enough when it comes to this topic. There's plenty to learn out there. It doesn't cost you any money. It doesn't take any time. And there are other people that need to hear about Pete's work um, on his radio show as well. Again, you can go to the website, which is ukhealthradio.com forward slash program, forward slash the D word. Uh, You can find him on Mixcloud, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and threads. And we will have all of that in the show notes as well. 
in closing, I just want to encourage you to go to alzheimerspeaks.com. Check out all of our free resources. You can access all of our radio shows, dementia chats, which are conversations with people living with dementia that are just fantastic. Our blog should be on there by then. We're merging the blog into the website finally after all these years. Find out about dementia in the arts. Maybe you want to participate in that a very exciting thing. We've got tools and so much more. And again, always um, don't forget to check out Dementia Map, which is a global resource directory. It's free to use. You will never be asked for any information. Uh, we're not going to pester you because we don't track you. We want a comfortable place where you can find information. And if you have a service product or tool and want to be part of Dementia Map, you can easily do that. The information is on the site or you can also set up a tour with myself. It's free to do. We also have, uh, of course, um, paid levels as well that are very economical. But again, it's free. So go ahead and tap into it. Together, things don't have to be expensive and we can spread the word of all the resources that are out there. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday season. And again, Pete, thanks for taking the time to be with us.